Welcome. Uh, welcome to the Blauwe Zaal, welcome to Studium Generaal, but most of all, welcome to this lecture. Since early times, many believe in seeing is believing. If there's one sense that most people value most, it is sight. Images arrive in superior HD quality and are being processed by our brain at high-speed velocity lightning speed. Today, you will find out there is more to seeing and to interpreting what we see than you would expect. We do this together with experimental psychologist Dr. Surya Gaye of Utrecht University and the Nijmegen Visual Cognitive Neuroscience Lab. He is fascinated by how our brain interprets, our brains interpret visual stimuli. What you see is what you get. Let's hear it from the man himself. Give him a warm welcome. Surya, the floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, can everyone hear me also in the back? Can I have a few thumbs up? Great, perfect. So I'm very happy to see this sort of packed crowd, especially considering the traffic strikes, but it seems that most people didn't notice that this was actually a thing. Um, it was for me. So today I'm going to try to convince you that uh, the world that you see around you is a simulated reality, a reality that has been simulated by your brain in order for you to successfully navigate your environment. Now, why am I here? Let me briefly um, introduce what I do. So I'm an assistant professor, as, as was introdu introduced at Utrecht University. Uh, I would consider myself an experimental psychologist uh, and a cognitive neuroscientist. Um, my, my interests, of course, it wouldn't surprise you, revolve around perception, uh, but perception is sort of quite a broad topic, right? So you have visual perception, auditory perception, and I'm going to briefly touch on both uh, today. But once you deal with perception, how you, how you experience the world, then you also deal with attention, with consciousness and awareness, uh, and there is also a big role of memory. And I hope that every, all of this will become clear uh, towards the end of the lecture. So I study this using a variety of methods, like uh, eye tracking, where you can see exactly where people are gazing, depending on what we ask them to do, or depending what they look at. Um, we also use uh, neural networks, um, uh, in which we model the brain in a more uh, simplified form. And one of the nice things there is that you can easily cut out parts of the artificial brain. And when I do this to my actual subjects, then the ethical committee is not so happy. So that's um, one of the pluses there. Uh, and mainly I use a lot of neuroimaging. So um, EEG, fMRI, those big magnets that your leg is pulled into after your skiing holiday. Uh, you can also put your brain in there and then we can actually see um, brain activity uh, changing as a function of what I ask you to do, what I ask you to look at, uh, or what I ask you to imagine. So, as I was uh, uh, introduced, um, seeing is believing. Uh, typically, we believe only when we see something. If we don't see something, we tend to cast doubt on it, right? So we put a lot of weight on what we perceived directly ourselves. Now, what I want to make clear now is that the other way around is at least as important, right? This is a two-way street, believing as seeing. So whatever you perceive really depends on your current beliefs, your current knowledge, and your predictions of what is supposed to happen, or what you're supposed to see, or what you're uh, predicted uh, to see. And this is very different from how a camera registers the world, right? Where you have these indiv individual pixels, and, and all these different pixels are then analyzed systematically, independently, they all carry equal weights, and equal resources are allocated to each individual pixel. For the brain, that's completely different. Now, let me give you an example. Whenever we're awake, we experience a very rich visual world, right? It's, it's moving, it's colorful, there are objects, plants, humans, uh, tons of things, more than we can actually name, right? And, it, and all of this is like this full HD experience, white screen, I would always, almost say. So that's what it feels like. Now, if we look at what we actually see, or actually what, what our, the image that our eyes receive, that is this tiny moving circle, circle there. That's everything that is registered. And I illustrated uh, at the top right, um, I magnified what's in there. So that's the information that you get, right? So um, whatever you see sharply, sharply at any given moment is about as wide as your thumb at an arm's length. So it's a very tiny image. The rest of it is mostly blurry, 
and the rest of it is mostly you filling in what should be there. Uh, or um, 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 averaging across multiple eye movements, because as you see, you sometimes look there, then you look there, right? So we move our eyes multiple times per second, which means that this image that we're seeing is not only very small, but it's also very jerky, right? It just wiggles around the entire time, and not only is it small and jerky, right? It's also actually inverted. So the information that enters our eyes directly does not in the, slightest, uh, uh, in the slightest resemble the conscious experience that we have of the world around us, right? Somehow, however, these tiny jerky inverted images is everything that our brain has to generate this conscious experience. It's our only gateway to the outside world. There's nothing else. It's all that our brain can work with. So with this limited amount of information, we have to do a lot of things, right? Um, so for instance, uh, we should try to navigate the world without bumping into obstacles. We should try to maybe um, um, detect dangers before the danger detects us, preferably. Uh, we want to interact with people to position ourselves in a societal hierarchy, maybe detect subtle emotions on the face. And we need to recognize objects, like for instance this glass of water, or an apple, or, or a person, or a screen. right? And all of this with this very limited amount of information. So we could say that our conscious experience of, of the visual world, of the world in general, um, serves the main purpose for us to successfully interact with the world, right? It's basically a very sort of resource costly machine for you to survive. A nice piece of software. So uh, just like with computers, brain processes cost resources. You don't get them from the power socket, but you get them from glucose mostly, uh, so whatever you eat. Um, and consciousness, having a conscious experience of something, is particularly costly. So this is a very nice study from the, I think from the 80s or uh, beginning of the, of the 90s, uh, in which uh, people would see words, like in this case Eindhoven, I don't think they actually saw that word, but who knows, and they were very briefly flashed and intermixed with some other, like which we call masks, which makes it very difficult to read these words. And what you then see is that you can um, create your settings such that people see this word on half of the occasions, but don't see it on the other half of the occasions. But the actual stimulation is identical, right? So it's basically at the limit, at the threshold of, of uh, perceptibility. Then you can contrast the situation in which people were seeing the world, th this word versus when they were not seeing this word. But again, the visual stimulation, whatever enters your eyes, is identical. And what you see is that despite that whatever enters the eyes is the same, when people are conscious, can actually report seeing this word, this uh, led to widespread and a lot of brain activity throughout the cortex. This shows that having a conscious experience of a stimulus costs a lot of energy. So that means that we need to select relevant information over irrelevant information, right? Because we just cannot process everything. It is too costly, it is inefficient. If we process everything, then our head would be the size of a Zeppelin, which it isn't. Um, and indeed, we do select relevant information. So if you show very simple um, uh, images like these types of colored circles to participants in a lab, um, right? You can, you can see how long you need to present those for participants to be able to detect them. So what you see is that this type of stimuli, people would need like, you would need to present them for 15 milliseconds for people to detect them, right? Both the blue one and the green one. What you can do is then in a pre-experiment, each time the blue stimulus goes away, people receive an electric shock. So I did this with my participants, and then I called it a shocking experiment, so a lot of people turned up, and then they were slightly disappointed afterwards. Uh, but what you do here is fear conditioning, right? Whenever people see the blue stimulus, they know they can expect a shock. And what happens afterwards, right, so this blue stimulus signals threat, and what you then see is that, well, the green stimulus, you still need to present it for 15 milliseconds for people to, to see it, but with the blue stimulus, nine milliseconds was already enough. So it's like a 50% reduction of the uh, presentation time for seeing this stimulus. So when something is relevant to us because it signals danger, we prioritize it, and very strongly so. 
Now, our conscious perception of the world, um, right, so what we see, is therefore not a copy of the outside world. It's not like an image that is also reflected in the back of your brain somewhere. It is a model of the world, a simplistic reductionist model or a simulation, if you prefer, that we can use to guide our behavior, that we can use to help us survive. And it's inherent to a model that it omits a lot of information, otherwise it doesn't help, right? So in other words, we fail to register um, large parts of the world that we're looking at. But how bad is that exactly? Now, we're going to do a little experiment. Uh, in a minute, you're going, you're going to see a flickering image. And uh, each time it flickers, something in the image is changing. And I want you to raise your hand whenever you see what is changing. OK, let's try. So if you have raised your hands, look around and see how many people haven't seen it yet. By now, you either don't see it, or you don't understand how others don't see it. I'm going to wait for a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to help you. It's the reel over there. So, why, why did you miss this, right? This is interesting. Why did you miss this? Because the reel is as large as the entire image. You had the impression that you were seeing an entire image, right? You didn't have the impression that you were just seeing like this, this tiny speck of information in the center of the image. But you didn't see the reel. It's really at the center of the image that you've been looking at the entire time. Still, you didn't see it for quite a long time. It's in between the two faces that you've probably repeatedly looked at a couple of times, but still you didn't, didn't see the reel in the middle changing. So this is basically how bad your perception is. You stare at something directly, you're looking for a change, you don't see it. Okay, so technically we register very little of the world around us. But then why does it feel like we have this very rich experience? Well, I think that the, main, the most probable answer to that is that our experience is actually very rich. It is just not reality. Right? We only get like tiny specks of information and we fill in the rest. We color it in like we had crayons. We fill it in based on our knowledge, based on our expectations. And as a consequence, we do have a very rich image. But whenever you change something that you're not currently attending, you just don't notice, as we just saw in the previous example. So there was a very nice study um, uh, from the 80s in which they uh, had these um, uh, participants read something like this. This is just generated by ChatGPT. Um, um, I asked ChatGPT to create a text about Eindhoven as if it was written by Shakespeare. Um, so participants were reading these texts. Um, and then the experimenters tracked the eye movements, right, as they would go through the text. Now, what you can do then, if you know exactly where people are looking, you can change the text accordingly. And what they did is that they actually changed the entire text to X's, except for the few words that people were actually fixating at that moment in time. And what they noticed is that none of the participants could actually tell whether the rest of the text was changed in X's or not. You just don't see it. Now you do because you're moving around. But if I had an eye tracker to actually look at where you're focusing and changing the rest accordingly, you wouldn't notice. OK, this is a bit of a contrived setup, right? Maybe in real life uh, that's different. We don't have these type of eye trackers in real life to change the world. Um, might be. But this is um, um, a barrier at the, at the entrance of the Koen Tunnel in Amsterdam. And it's incredibly salient, right? It's very high contrast. It's white, it's red, there are flickering orange lights. Couldn't miss it. It's like immediately like, right in front of you if you're driving there. Couldn't miss it. However, there have been a lot of instances of people not seeing the barrier, driving at full speed and crashing into it, sometimes even with fatal consequences. Right? So people actually sometimes fail to see these very obvious, very salient bits of visual input in front of them. 
Why, could, why would that be? Maybe because you just don't expect a barrier to be there in the middle of the highway. Okay, so our brain doesn't randomly fill in everything. It fills in everything in a smart way, based on what we know of the world. Okay, so here, for instance, we see a checkerboard um, uh, with a, a, a cylinder on top. And we see a checkerboard, so we know that there are sort of dark and white squares. However, if you look at the actual color of the squares, this uh, black square on top and the white square in the middle are actually the exact same color. Right? So if I remove the context, you can see these are the exact same color. Yet your brain doesn't see the exact same color. Why? Well, because there is a shadow from the cylinder that is being casted on the checkerboard. And you know that whenever there is a shadow casted on something, it should look darker, and your brain automatically compensates for that. That is useful, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to recognize the white squares as being white if you did not compensate for the shadow. And even now you know this, you cannot unsee it. This is not a volitional, conscious, deliberate process. This is something that your visual system has learned. This is another example. Here, these white and black circles are identical. You might not believe me. You can look it up. Uh, you can find it online. They are the same. And the, 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 the fact that we see them the same is reflected in the earliest processes of our brain. So, for instance, consider the pupil light response. The pupil light response is, like, is a physiological measure, basically a reflex that regulates how much light enters our eyes. When there's too much light, the pupil becomes smaller. When there's too little light, the pupil becomes bigger so that we can still um, adequately perceive our environment. Now, despite the white and the black circle being factually identical, the pupil actually constricts more when people gaze at the white circle and dilates more when looking at the black circle. So even this very early ref reflex-like physiological responses are subject to these types of illusions, if you want. Similarly, if you look at the brain and you look at activity patterns that are typically evoked by seeing a white circle, um, and you look at activity patterns that are typically evoked by seeing a black circle, um, then um, when seeing this well, fake white circle, your, your brain will actually think it sees a white circle. When seeing this fake black circle, it will think you see a black circle. Right? So from, very, from the deepest levels of visual processing, from the earliest level of visual processing, you use context, knowledge, predictions to shape your perception. And imagine that your visual cortex, where the visual input is being processed, doesn't know where information comes from, where it comes from your eyes or from your predictions, it is just active or not. Okay. So this is another brilliant study, actually, by one of my close colleagues that, that illustrates how, how predictions are incorporated into the fabric of our conscious perception. So what they did here is that they presented a disk that was moving, like this, or you can see it again, and people would see this disk numerous times. Now, because the, the, the cortex, the, the brain of humans, is organized such that if you stimulate a particular location in the visual field, then a particular a location in the cortex will be activated. So based on that, you can actually reconstruct where people were seeing something based on the brain activity alone. Right? So then if you see a disk like this, you can actually reconstruct based on the brain activity what people are seeing. So these uh, uh, lower parts represent the reconstructions and the upper part is the actual stimulus. Right, this is also, this is, of course, I, I just made this in PowerPoint, but the, the actual precision is about as good as this. Now, then you can do a little trick. What you can then do is you can just remove the stimulus, after the disk, after two instances, and then see what your visual cortex then still is seeing. So that's what happens here. Stops. And what you then perceive, and also what your brain perceives, is that it actually fills in the rest of the sequence. Your visual cortex still sees whatever you expect to see, and therefore it's not so surprising that you also subjectively perceive it, because it's there, it's actually happening physically, measurably. 
And that might seem like an error, but of course, imagine that you're in a car um, and you're tracking some other car and suddenly uh, maybe your vision becomes uh, blurry because of fog, maybe there's a truck passing by, but still, you would expect the car not to vanish in thin air, right? You would want to know where the car remains. So it actually makes sense to continue tracking an object despite it suddenly disappearing. Things don't suddenly disappear in the real world. Um, so take a look at this red flag, right? We have a red flag and a red letter, or this, uh, this uh, can of uh, Coca-Cola, um, obviously um, also the color that we know it should be, and then these nice strawberries. All of these look red, but by now you might not be surprised that actually there is nothing red in here, right? These are all just gray pixels. We make them red. Why do we make them red? Because we compensate for the illumination around it. So the fact that our brain just fills in everything um, is not so problematic because it fills in, in in a smart way such that now we're still able to find berries uh, in a bush independent of the current lighting conditions. We are able to do it at night uh, when the light is more yellow, more blue. We can recognize a banana this, the, independent of the current lighting conditions, right? So this is useful. Um, and we have more of these types of, of assumptions, right? We have the assumption that whenever something is further away, it should produce a smaller image. Here, this is not the case. These three cars are exactly as large, but because we compensate for the distance, right, we see the car in the back being larger than the car in the front. This is not a volitional process. You, can, you cannot unlearn it. But we fill in in a smart way. We adjust our perception in a smart way. Now, if it is true that our perception of the world depends on our knowledge, then we can make a very simple prediction. The prediction is that whenever I change your knowledge, that should also change your perception. So let's give it a try. So here, most people would see a brick wall. Now, if I show you that there is here a cigar sticking out of the wall, Most of the people would see it now. And then I remove this marker again. Now, most of you, knowing that there's a cigar, will see the cigar. The image hasn't changed, your knowledge has changed, and therefore your perception of the world has changed. If someone shows you the same example, three months from now, you will immediately see the cigar. I changed your knowledge, and you changed perception accordingly. This is not only the case with, with visual information, this also holds for auditory information. Now, um, we're going to do a little demo here, um, and I have an audio clip, and you should listen to it very carefully. Now, because the audio is of very bad quality, I have written the word that you're supposed to hear, or the words in this case. Okay, so let's see whether you can hear the words, and please raise your hand when you hear them. That was, that was quite instantaneous. Okay, so one more. Let's try it again. Um, again, raise your hand as soon as you can hear the word uh, brainstorm. Again, 90% of the room putting their hands up in the air. Okay, so believe it or not, but you have heard the same sound clip twice. It was identical. If you don't believe it, I'm going to show it again, and now you can just choose in whichever order you want to hear Green Needle or Brainstorm. Just try it. There's one uh, slide in, uh, in Dutch, my bad. So how, how reliable is this conscious experience really, right? So because conscious perception mostly consists of stuff that we made up, 
Some people have called it a controlled hallucination, right? Because a hallucination is basically something that you see or hear that is not generated by sensory input, but that is generated by yourself. It is generated from the inside. Now, maybe you don't like the word hallucination because it, it, it feels like sort of your ordinary day-to-day -day perception shouldn't sound like something uh, that, that someone with, with schizophrenia might have or something that you would experience if you're on drugs. Um, but that's where the word controlled comes in. It's a controlled hallucination because the hallucination, the, 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 the sensory experience is generated from the inside, from you, but it's controlled because it is tested on the outside world. So every time you sample a little bit of information from the outside world, you can see whether it matches or mismatches your current perception. It might be that I was hallucinating a horse. I look there, there is no horse. So I would try that. I would try to change that. I would regulate that. I would remove the, the horse and then probably see something else. And this is an active process, right? A process of predicting what would be in all the locations that you're not currently attending and a process of regulating that, testing it against uh, reality, against the actual samples of your perception. Um, nonetheless, a very small part of your experience comes from the sensory input, whereas a very large part comes from, um, well, yourself. It's self-generated. So are we completely tripping the entire day? Um, uh, no, right? Because I say, as I said, we're, we're testing uh, const constantly what we're actually seeing. But maybe, are there people who have done hallucinogenic drugs here? Are there teachers here? Because then they probably will not respond. So, for those who have done uh, uh, magic mushrooms, for instance, you can experience this gradual transition. It usually starts out with you just seeing the world as it should be, it's, it's normal. So whatever you perceive, you can test it, it's actually there. And then people will start getting worse at testing their perception against the real sensory input. Either they get worse at testing it, or they get worse at adjusting it, but what you see is that suddenly the visual input will be slightly different from the actual uh, uh, um, experience that you have. And then at some point, your experience is completely different from the sensory input, but you can see or experience this gradual transition. And it's the same with people that have hallucinations because of, for instance, schizophrenia. Uh, their disorder might actually be a disorder of testing or re regulating um, the exact same hallucinations that we all have, but they just fail to adjust them based on the sensory input that they receive. So, um, most of the times, with controlled hallucinations, we agree with one another, right? I hallucinate the same lecture hall that you guys are hallucinating, more or less, right? Pending some differences. Sometimes that is not the case. And you might have remembered the, the dress which broke the internet um, uh, a few years ago. So now, of course, I want to know how many people see this dress in black and blue? How many people see this dress in white and gold? Ooh, that's nice, a nice 50-50 split. So sometimes... Sometimes we do not agree on what we experience, right? And here, I'm sure that some marriages have, have broken up because of this, right? People get really angry. When I, when I just said black and blue, the first reaction I heard was, what? I'm not sure who it was, it was somewhere in the front there. So people get really sort of hyped up about this. Like, it doesn't match what I'm seeing. Um, so what happens here? Well, I think we've seen the answer to this before. Um, but it has to do that we have different implicit assumptions about what we're looking at. We might either be assuming implicitly that this dress is inside, where there is mostly yellowish light. So we compensate for the yellow and therefore we see mostly black and blue. We might assume that this dress is actually outside where light is mostly blue. And then you compensate for the blue, leaving mostly yellow or gold, if you will, and white. And it's easy to demonstrate, right? I have this little drop there, that's a piece of this dress, which I, it's, it remains the same, 
But when it's under blue lighting conditions, you see it as white and yellow. When it's under the yellow lighting conditions, you see it as black and blue. Right? It changes right in front of your eyes. So, I'm going to um, um, uh, summarize what we've um, uh, seen today. There is a very rich outside world. I think we can all agree on that. Um, then there is this rich conscious experience, which is a, a model of the world, but it feels rich, so it is rich. The, the experience itself is rich. But then there is this bottleneck, which is, well, what, what we actually register, like whatever enters our eyes, is very poor sensory input. So what happens there? Well, first, we have to select relevant information based on our behavior, based on our goals, right? So that basically determines which part of the sensory input we will attend and receive priority. And then, when, once we have this sensory input, which is at least, hopefully, the most relevant sensory input, then we need to build this rich conscious experience again. And uh, we do this by generating um, um, basically an entire visual world, that's this hallucinating part, this hallucinating part, by filling it in, all of this done based on our knowledge about the world, right? Our knowledge that stuff doesn't disappear into oblivion when it's suddenly occluded, uh, that stuff looks smaller when it's further away, our knowledge that strawberries are red, and so on. So, some considerations and implications. You mostly see with your brains, not your eyes, that's just a minute part of it. Your experience depends on your knowledge, and your knowledge differs from mine, right? And because of that, different people perceive the same world differently. And this is something that is important to take into consideration. For instance, when you're explaining things to your uh, trainees, for instance, something might seem obvious to you, might seem crisp and clear to you, but since their knowledge differs from that of you, they don't see it the same way you do. They do not see what you see. So this is something important to take into consideration. Now, I will leave you with this little friend here. Uh, this is the C squirt, and a very nice name, by the way. And the C squirt has two distinct life stages. Um, in the first stage of life, the sea squirt is basically navigating the oceans, looking for a nice rock to settle on. And then in the second life stage, once it has found this nice little rock, it will settle, and then it cannot navigate anymore. So what it does, it actually eats its own brain, because it doesn't need its brain anymore. It's not navigating, so there's no need for a brain. So if I haven't convinced you that we mostly see our environment and navigate through our environment using our brains rather than our eyes, then I hope that the sea squirt um, has convinced you. So by that, I want to thank you for your attention, and I think I have some time maybe for a few questions. Thank you. Thank you, Syria, for uh, letting us uh, see things clearer. Are there any questions out of the audience? for Dr. Gaillet. We have a catch box here. Yep, I see there one. <laughs> nice try. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I was wondering about the image with the strawberries, which was gray, but you perceive it as red. Um, why doesn't that happen in black and white movies then? Because if the whole image was gray, how come we don't fill in the, Im the colors of a black and white movie? Okay, so there are two answers uh, to that. The first one is that um, if you look at brain regions that process, for instance, red uh, or, or yellow, if you show them a uh, black and white strawberry or banana, then the brain will actually somewhat um, think there is color there, even very slightly. Uh, but the, the, the more accurate answer, or the more complete answer here um, is that um, the reason you saw red is because of the lighting conditions. The lighting was green. So you compensated for the lighting by removing all the green. What happens if you remove green, then red remains. That is the principle of color opponency. So we tend to just remove general lighting because we're not interested in general lighting. We're interested in the color of actual objects. Can you throw it here? And pass it on, please. I speak in the... the, the yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? 
Oh, yeah, I think so. Um, there is a really interesting case with an old woman uh, who was suffering of uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome, and she was completely blind. She was born blind, and she started to hallucinate colors and really complex images suddenly. Uh, can you give us any explanation for this kind of situation? <laughs> Well, I'm not familiar with this particular case. Um, I think that one aspect is that it's very tricky to find out whether this person was hallucinating colors, because how can she communicate what the color is if she hasn't seen them before? So that, that's, that's one aspect that makes it tricky, by the same token that I'm not sure whether you see this orange color the same way that I do, right? So what is a color? Um, so so that, that's one aspect to it. Uh, the other thing is that um, the brain, is its default stance is not to be inactive. It is generally active. And when there are brain regions that have evolved to be particularly good at re representing some type of information, like colors, for instance, uh, then what you see in, I'm not sure about congenitally blind people, but in blind people, that for instance, these brain regions will be captured by other um, um, uh, um, senses mostly. So for instance, you will see that people that were blind, uh, well, that either were born blind or became blind, then suddenly when they try to visualize the world using sound, using other senses, that it will also activate these regions there that are in place. So I think it's probably sort of a, a matchup between these processes. Um, but it's hard to tell for sure because I don't know this particular case. Uh, I have, we have, oh, I have another really small question. Um, as far as I'm concerned, most of the people who are taking psychedelics, they see fractals. There is a pattern of seeing fractals. Why is that the case? Yeah, uh, I don't know the exact answer, but I, I think it's related to, uh, so I mean, we, we all have like the same global machinery, right? So um, one thing is that, for instance, when people have near-death experiences, they tend to see this tunnel. Um, which has probably something to do that peripheral vision is extinct extinguished first and then central vision is extinguished last and then that, that leads to the perception of a, of a tunnel and that's because we all have this common machinery and this is probably something about a common machinery that leads us to see fractal-like uh, things but what the exact uh, machinery is there I wouldn't know but it's not so strange that we have common hallucinations since our brains do resemble uh, one another. Mathematics are pretty important to study the word. <laughs> Sorry, what? The fundamentals of mathematics are pretty important to study the word. I mean, anything can be described in terms of mathematics, but I'm not sure that the neurons are aware that they're doing mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's a nice ending of this, that neurons don't recognize mathematics. I hope you enjoyed the, the, the lecture. I did. Thank you once Thank you. again, Surya. Uh, hope to see you next week at uh, something completely different, Power Paradise. And, uh, yeah, quite random, but also not. Don't be a C-squirt. Go voting today. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>